OK? Um, I didn't want to get political, but <laughs> how many people feel that giant industries are here to serve you to the best of what they can do for you? <laughs> OK. So and before I give any background, um, how many people take emergency? You know that, those little packets in the store? How many people have taken it? Who, who owns emergency? Pfizer. Pfizer. How many people take um, Garden of Life from the health food store? Okay, who owns Garden of Life? Nestle. You know, most of the companies that exist in the stores and in your doctor's offices have been bought out by, by giant companies like this, which isn't really what we're going to talk about. But um, it's not just supplements. I love Epic Provisions, the snack bars. They got bought up by General Mills. So um, to give a little bit of background, for about 25 years, I worked, I was practicing, but I also worked with a company um, whose name is Thorn Research. I don't know how many people know them. They're a company that a lot of um, nature paths and chiropractors use. In fact, I was probably responsible for most of the chiropractors using their supplements. Um, I, I think they're, in terms of vitamins and minerals, I think they're a good company. But, but there's a lot of things I learned there, and also I learned when we visited, when we were back in school, we used to visit companies that manufactured vitamins and so forth. And things have really changed in the 42 years I've been in practice, just like the world has changed and food has changed and everything else. So we wanted to give you some awareness. And when you get this awareness, realize that the chances of your doctor regardless if they're an MD, naturopath, chiropractor, having this awareness is very, very small because it's not something that the companies tell you about. Them. But it is something that you should know for when you make decisions. I mean, Chris's talk was scary. Our talk is depressing. <laughs> I can't read. Do you want me to read? Yeah, or, or just. The little follow-up is scary. <laughs> So over the past few decades, more and more raw materials are made overseas. Um, if a bottle says made in the USA, that just means it was bottled in the USA. It means nothing else. It doesn't tell you where anything is actually from. It means they put the bottle together in the US, nothing more. Um, a lot of the raw materials are derived from GMO bacteria and fungi. A lot of your vitamins and minerals, that's not listed on the label. That does not need to be listed on the label. We're going to get into that in detail. Um, to, and that's how they make a lot of specific vitamins, minerals, amino acids. Also, they use a lot of nasty solvents. Um, acetone, among other chemicals, are used to refine the nutrients out, and that's how they pull them. Um, and again, can ship to the USA, tableted or encapsulated here, or it says made in USA, but the ingredients, the capsule, the bottle, possibly the label was made in the USA. That's probably the only thing in your bottle that was actually made here. So just something to think about. Um, fillers, binders, lubricants, anti-caking agents, disintegrants, preservatives, flow agents, that's actually a majority of what's in the capsules in, or tablets in a vitamin. Um, they speed up manufacturing, they prevent clumping, they fill extra space, and they can cause a lot of negative things. Um, I mean, you can take, a, I mean, it obviously depends on the different items, but let's say an herb, you might be able to encapsulate 10,000 capsules an hour, versus if you add some type of lubricant, you could do a million capsules an hour. Things can speed up tremendously by adding these things, and most people will add them because it brings down the cost tremendously. But they don't think of what that's actually doing for the body, either deleterious effects or decreased absorption. Or a lot of the companies just don't have an awareness of that because what they do is they don't do their own manufacturing. They just farm it out to whoever gives them the cheapest bid, and you know, those companies will do that because it's just more profitable. So if you had a, a vitamin B12 capsule, what's the typical dose? Just anyone have an idea? It might be one milligram. 
like 1,000 micrograms. And you might have one that's a little bit higher, maybe 5 milligrams if it's a super high one. The size of the capsule is 200 milligrams. So the, you know, the question is, what are the other 195? You know, so you're getting you know, maybe 1% active ingredient and 99% other stuff. And if you're taking 10 or 15 different supplements, that compounds and adds and adds and adds, and you're taking a big handful of other stuff. Um, another thing is a lot of fillers and flow agents and desiccants and things like that don't actually have to be legally listed on the label. Um, one example is Kamu Kamu. I mean, yeah, how many people have ever bought Kamu in the store as a vitamin C supplement? So if you buy it, a lot of them are kind of nice, bright pink. And you get very few that are kind of like ugly brown powder. And taste disgusting. So what makes them nice and bright and pink is they take a little bit of Kamu juice and they spray it on maltodextrin. And you know, which is basically a starch sugar type compound, and they can just basically call it 100% Kamu Kamu. And it's all thin GMO corn derived maltodextrin. Could be other, could be better quality, but oftentimes. And that doesn't have to be listed on the label. You can just do 100% Kamu Kamu and list the capsule. That's legal. Or if something like, let's say you, let's say we were a vitamin company and we decided we wanted to put vitamin C in a capsule and we buy a vitamin C that comes from wherever, and the people over there, say in China or in India or wherever, they put in cornstarch and they put in other things into the vitamin C. Since we didn't put them in, we don't have to list them. And most of your sales reps and things for companies don't have a clue if you ask them these things. They're like, they'll just shrug their shoulders. Or they'll deny it. That too. Um, one thing my dad and I harp on is, you know, a lot of supplements add made in a GMP facility or something along those lines. I mean, that's basically going to a doctor that graduated from medical school. It has to be done. There's no other way to do it. If you want to legally sell a vitamin, it has to be done in a GMP facility. Just like um, if, if you look at chicken and it's labeled antibiotic free, all chicken has to be antibiotic free in the USA. It's illegal to give antibiotics to chickens, I believe, last I researched. So it's one of those things, oh, it sounds good, but that doesn't mean anything. It just means it's a supplement, nothing else. Um, or, yeah, like I said, bag spinach being labeled gluten-free. I mean, yeah, it means nothing. Um, so, you know, we wanted to give just a few examples, like vitamin B1 can be very important. We do use it in practice sometime. Um, I've used it with some good results. But where does it come from? Um, generally, it's made from E. coli or salmonella, and oftentimes that is GMO E. coli that they made to produce B1. They basically take E. coli, they genetically modify it, and then they feed it certain things so it poops out B1, basically. And I'm not sure, but I think they can still label no GMO, because when they do that, they're referring to the food, not to the microbes. And it's, it says coal tar. If, if you were to buy the vitamin, say, in the store 30 years ago, before they were doing all the genetic modification of microbes, it would have been a coal tar derivative, which it, it's hard to say which is worse. But um. Um, Vitamin B2 is made by a type of fungus, which I can't pronounce. Um, and it's devastating to citrus and cotton crops. Um, cotton crops. And sometimes other fungi or candida can be used to make B2. Again, riboflavin. I've used it well. but you got to look where it's coming from. Vitamin D3 is mainly co um, coming from a GMO E. coli where they add in Rhodococcus um, rhodocris. So basically they're, again, splicing in different thing, different bacteria into different bacteria and making things. And re remember what we were talking about yesterday when we were talking about how the body remembers certain things. So if, if your body takes, say, a vitamin B2 that's derived from a candida species and you've had candida issues, your body's going to send up some alarm signals and it's going to end up having some alarm inflammatory reaction instead of being able to absorb it and, and use it. And again, some of these, you know, you can have, you won't find out from a supplement company where their B vitamin or whatnot comes from. And that's Most why- Most of the time they don't know. That's true, they don't know. I mean, I think that's part of the reason, like sometimes in our office, we'll stock two or three different things of the same vitamin and they'll test different on different people. So if you have one that was more fungal derived, it's probably not gonna test on someone that's had a bad fungal history or so on and so forth. 
um, B12 mutated and genetically engineered bacterial strains. They add UV light and other chemicals to make it B12, nice and joyful. Um, vitamin C, that's one, you know, some vitamin C comes from GMO corn. That can be a common one. Some comes from coal tar, others from glucose that undergoes a fungal fermentation where they use candida albicans. Um, you're getting yeah, from GMO corn oftentimes. Um, beta carotene um, derived from GMO E. coli that they ferment. So you got to think of most vitamins are coming from GMO microbes. I think it's like over 80% on the market now are coming from that. And this is your health food brands as well as anyone else? Because none of the companies manufacture their own vitamins. And so these are the old school sources, which in some ways could be better, you can make a case for. Um, you know, like we said, vitamin, different Bs, coal tar oxidized with nitric oxide, vitamin C, hydrogenated sugar processed with acetone, um, vitamin K, coal tar derivative produced with peleic nickel. Um, you know, in some ways those are better, which is kind of a scary thought. But again, that's where your vitamins are coming from if you're not getting them from food itself. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot, but there's a few companies that will advertise as whole food supplements. And some of them have been around for a while. And whole food supplements can mean different things. Like some whole food supplements, most of them, what they do is they take the chemical vitamins we just talked about and they feed it to something. So for instance, in most cases with the B vitamins, they take the chemical B vitamins and they feed them to a yeast. So the yeast eats the vitamins, and then they can call it a whole food vitamin, but it's still the chemical vitamin you know, that that one cell organism ate. Um, except, again, if you're using whole foods, like you're using, say, Kamu as a source of vitamin C, you know, you're not going to get as high a potency, but you're going to get a, a God-given synergy between you know, the different ingredients in there. You know, but again, there, there aren't there aren't a lot of substances where you can have a whole food of a certain thing and, and have a significant amount in there. I mean, there are some things, you know, like you could have a liver supplement that has a good supply of vitamin B12 or, you know, different things like that. But in general, it, it's pretty rare to have one that hasn't gone through some type of ultra refining process. I mean, one benefit with some things like, let's take commerce. Like my dad said, I mean, if you're taking an ascorbic acid, a vitamin C supplement, you know, you might be two grams or higher of vitamin C that you're getting in. Well, Kamu, if you get natural whole berry, you might get 90 milligrams, much, much lower level. But in our practice, I generally see that to work better than a straight ascorbic acid because I think when you leave in the cofactors and the enzymes and everything, basically the synergy that God made in whole food, that it works a lot better than isolating and taking something out. And so even though the levels are lower, it can work much better. The other thing that goes on, which we're going to talk about when we show some labels, is some companies are just deceitful. So there, there's a company that um, is used a lot in natural doctor's offices, and they advertise as whole food nutrition. So when you read the label, they might have you know, some good stuff, and they might have carrot and buckwheat and some other things. But, but the most important thing in my mind to read when you're reading a vitamin label is the part that says other ingredients. So when you read, for instance, on one of these labels we're going to see, you know, this is a vitamin C supplement and it has, again, I, I'm not sure which foods, but then when you read the other ingredients, one of the other ingredients is ascorbic acid. So it's not a whole food supplement. It's a chemical supplement with some whole food mixed in with it. I mean, you might as well buy just a chemical vitamin C and take a bite of a food. You know, it'll be cheaper. You'll be getting more of the C. It, you know, it doesn't. But, but again, a lot of companies will do that as a marketing tool, but they're, they're not really being truthful. Um, again, label. Um, it's like if a vitamin is marked as natural, it only has to include 10% of natural plant-derived ingredients. The other 90% can be synthetic. Again, that's the legal standard, which is a pretty low bar. Um, now brand, which we're not picking on now brand whatsoever. This is something we pulled off of their website. They said to in, in order to avoid ingredients from a specific country such as China, one would eliminate virtually all of the world's supply of certain vitamins, such as vitamin C and many of the B vitamins. So again, it's pretty much all being imported, which doesn't 
have to be bad, but it is being imported. Um, and yeah, again, so it doesn't mean bad, but a lot of things can fall under the rug that way, not as strict of standards and whatnot. Um, minerals tend to be better as a whole than vitamins because they can be more mined. Um, they go through a refinement process, chelated out, so they are better, but they still are ultra refined. You do have to be careful though with minerals because some of the very common trace mineral supplements out there can be very toxic because yeah, like, they... Like if you get the ones that say they have 80 trace minerals in them or something like that, you know, and you look at source. I mean, a lot of the, some of them are sourced from the Great Salt Lake, which is one of the most polluted bodies of water that exists. And, and when you get, when it says it has so many trace minerals and you ask them for a mineral analysis, there's all these radioactive elements, and there's mercury, and there's aluminum, and there's this and that. And if you talk to them, they might say, well, that's healthy mercury in, in this one, because it's a natural source, but there, there isn't such a thing. It's kind of like the Marisol. You know, that's the healthy mercury that's in vaccines. That's an okay form, unlike other types of mercury. Um, so again, reading the label, we wanted to teach some things, just good knowledge to have of reading um, the form of the nutrient, the other ingredients, giving some example of other ingredients, where they come from, all of that is some of the most important things. And you know, we have people bring in their supplements all the time. And you know, I always like to read labels and educate patients on why something could be good or could be bad. I mean, like I said yesterday, anything that's strong enough to help you if you need it can also be strong enough to hurt you if you don't need it. So the first thing we always like to do is eliminate all the junk supplements that honestly should belong in the trash. And then if you have good supplements, evaluating, okay, do you actually need it or not? And so those are two different and steps. When I started practice, I'd say about half of my patients would do well on a very high quality multivitamin. Um, at this point in time, maybe 1% of my patients would do well on a multivitamin. Again, I don't know if it's just the sources, you know, but again, there, there's, there probably isn't such a thing as a healthy multivitamin just because of all the things we've told you, but, but very few people will thrive on something like that. The only people that do well on those are the people who could live on Twinkies their whole life and live to 102. And, and they can get their calcium by taking a bite of the sidewalk. But you know, there are a lot of us that aren't like that. And our bodies are more picky, and they want more natural, whole forms. And those people, even on most of the health food brands, are not going to do well, in our opinion. Healthy form of a multivitamin. This morning, we had Chris over. We had grass-fed beef bacon. We had papaya. We had pineapple. We had pitaya. Um, all that kind of stuff. That's a healthy multi. Get as many colors in as you can. We're in Hawaii. It's great for that. The other so. thing, which I don't think we have a slide about, but when we were talking about um, fungi yesterday, um, you know, a lot of people take enzymes. And if you take an enzyme, the enzymes are going to come from a couple of possible sources. Um, most of the time, they either come from pork, if it's labeled like pancreatin, or if they have if they break down the different enzymes and they have an ASC after at the end, like lipase, protease, amylase, you know, all of those things, and they tell you how much, those, are, those come from fungus. Um, so they're fungal derived, usually from aspergillus, but they could be from some other fungi. And again, if your body's ever had an issue with fungi, a lot of times, even though they might help your digestion at the same time, there's a decent chance you're gonna have a sensitivity reaction to those things. So they're gonna do some good and some bad at the same time. So, um, you know, the only exceptions would be, say, pineapple, like, and maybe the bromelain in it, and papaya with the pain in it, which would have protein digesting enzymes kind of more from a, a food source. So like my dad mentioned in terms of fillers, you know, in your average B12 supplement, just for math, um, there's 100 micrograms in a 150 milligram capsule. That's those tiny little capsules. So one 1500th is B12 and the rest is filler. So you gotta know what the rest of that is. Fillers can include lactose, sucrose, magnesium and calcium sterates, vegetable sterates, stearic acid, titanium dioxide, silicon dioxide, plant cellulose, and we're going to talk a little bit about those also. There's definitely, you know, the fewer the fillers, the better as a general rule. No fillers the best. But 
with certain things, like if you want to, if you need a B12 supplement, you there has to be fillers. There's no other way to take it. So looking for ones that are better quality than others, so you're not getting in uh, 1,499 parts junk and one part good. Well, there actually is a, a way you could do it, but who would buy a capsule that had like a little dot and the rest was air? <laughs> but that, that would be the way to do it. Um, so those are examples of fillers. Binders are things that basically hold things together. Um, typically sugar derivative, it's sticky, holds things together, or can be microcrystalline cellulose. Um, that's the better option generally. It's usually made from hydrolysis of wood pulp. They add sulfuric acid or hydrogen bromide. Um, it's a filler and a binder. Um, in non-sensitive people, it can pass through the GI tract unchanged. Everything's good. You basically poop it out. In some people, though, it can cause side effects, including gas, bloating, diarrhea, depression, fatigue, forgetfulness. Um, you know, when we take patients off their supplements and they feel a lot better, sometimes it's because they're getting, they were getting an active ingredient that wasn't the right one for them. Other times, their body's just happy to not get all these binders and fillers going through their system. I mean, if, if you go to a physician who puts you on a supplement and keeps you on it indefinitely, you should really question that. Because again, um, it might throw things out of balance. You know, there, there's often, like Chris was bringing up, some underlying reason why you need it. You know, if you work in Macy's, I don't know if they have a perfume section in Macy's, but if they do and you were to work in the perfume section, you might need to take molybdenum every day until you, you know, come to your senses and change your job. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, but otherwise, if you kept needing it, you know, there might be a reason. You know, you have a fungus in your body that's producing acid aldehyde. So, you know, get rid of the fungus. I used to always need to take zinc. And when I ended up on a diet that had low phytic acid in it, which basically meant um, very little grain, beans, seeds, and nuts, because those have phytic acid. And phytic acid, and some people can really rob your body of zinc and calcium and magnesium and so forth. Suddenly, I didn't need zinc anymore. You know, there, there are things, if you keep needing something, you know, investigate why is that. You know, don't just take it for forever. I mean, yeah, like my dad mentioned, I had a patient that kept having headaches. And she had improved like 80%, but she was still having mild headaches. She kept needing zinc. Zinc was helping how she felt. But again, if she kept needing zinc and she kept having mild headaches, I knew I was missing something. So I checked over 200 foods on her. And I forget exactly which, but I took her off of like cucumber, celery, and spinach or something like that. And then all of her headaches went away. So it was, again, you know, digging deeper, like we talked about yesterday, finding the root cause instead of just trying to cover up. And then ideally, you don't need these supplemental things. Um, disintegrants, so things that can help break down a capsule or a tablet. Um, sodium starch glycosate, most often used. That's derived from potato, corn, rice, or wheat. Can be GMO, um, can cause allergic reactions. As a general rule, don't do tablets. They're going to be way worse for you than capsules. There are exceptions, and some things can't be capsulized. But as a general rule, tablets don't get broken down well. Um, if you look at scopes and like large intestines, a lot of the times um, the tablets aren't fully broken down by then, and so you're not getting the benefit. And sometimes the binders and disintegrants that they're using to, in it itself aren't very good. Yeah, back in the old days, before we had so many wimpy people, um, <laughs> we used to always have patients chew their supplements, no matter what they were. And some of them were pretty gross, but you know, you have amylase in your mouth, and, and amylase, beside helping break down starch, it kind of signals your body what you're eating, and it can prepare and tell it like you know what it's supposed to do and where it's supposed to go and so forth. So if you're just swallowing, you miss that stage, and it's not as good. And that's also a benefit of eating your natural things if you're able to. Um, sterates. This is a huge one. I'd say sterates are in like 99. Point 9% of supplements out there. It doesn't matter if it's a good brand, doesn't matter if it's a bad brand. Most of them have vegetable sterate, magnesium sterate, calcium sterate, one of those. Um, basically, sterates are one of the big things that allows them to run supplements so much faster. It's a fat. So it allows, basically lubes the supplement lines so they can run capsules and tablets much faster. Um, you have a couple different issues with it. Um, one of the big issues is because it's a fat, it's going to coat the ingredients so it's not going to get absorbed well by the body. It's not going to get broken down, so you're not actually going to get it. Um, another is, I mean, calcium stearate is the main component of soap scum. 
That's another thing. They've shown different allergic reactions. And most steroids actually come from GMO cottonseed oil. That's a high majority. There are some like calcium steroids that come from palm oil or different things like that, but most <coughs> vegetable or magnesium steroids are going to go from GMO cottonseed oil, which I'm assuming most people here wouldn't eat anything that said GMO cottonseed oil on it. But, oh, magnesium steroid in a supplement, that's cool. Magnesium, that sounds good, and I'm just going to take it. So again, knowing where things come from really will make a, it look a lot different. Um, titanium dioxide. Um, that would only be in the really poor quality supplements. Yeah, it basically just makes things look white. Um, but it's been linked to a lot of different um, carcinogen, carcinogenic, but also some um, celiac or um, celiac type symptoms in people. It can mimic. Um, they did some studies, so definitely not something you really want to be getting in your body. Other lubricants, um, there are other ones that over the years, I would say we would consider as better lubricants. Again, quote unquote better. Better than the alternatives, but still not great. Um, two of them, ascorbyl palmitate, it's in some vitamins and minerals that we use. Um, it can aggravate skin damage due to UV exposure. It's a fat-soluble vitamin C, doesn't exist naturally in nature. Um, but it's, you know, scoble palmitate sounds kind of natural if you just read it. Um, leucine, it's an amino acid. Amino acids are good for you, aren't they? I mean, you want to take them to make you strong and things like that. But, you know, it can be potentially safe. And again, it's one of the better ones, but it can lead to kidney stress due to the negative nitrogen balance, doing an imbalance of amino acids. Overdose can lead to increased blood amino levels, therefore causing brain damage and liver disease. And so, like my dad was mentioning, you know, with methylcobalamin as an example, if you're taking 6, 10, 15 different pills a day from a good company that adds leucine in, and leucine is the one main thing in it, you're getting several grams of leucine a day. So that's really going to throw off your amino acid balance by getting a lot more of that and not getting your other amino acids in, and then it can screw things up. And again, then if you're taking that for a short period of time, that's one thing. But if you're on auto ship and you keep taking the same thing for months and months and months and months, not so good. Um, cumulative. I mean, so this is what I was saying. We wrote out, you know, so as patients who's on a combined of 10 capsules or tablets daily would ingest on average 2.8 grams of inactive ingredients, which is more likely to create imbalances um, of even the less harmful other ingredients. I mean, I. It's rarely I ever recommend 2.8 grams of something that a person needs in a day. There are a few things, but generally not. So you're getting a lot more junk than you are what you're trying to get. And, and things are better than they used to be. Most companies now list their, or maybe all companies, I'm not sure, list their flow agents like leucine, while back you know, 20 years ago, none of them did. Yeah. So at least you're, you're getting more information from the companies. Um, Capsules, you know, you have a few different options. Gelatin is one, um, one type of capsule. Um, can be made from beef or pork. So vegetarian people, not great. If you don't need pork, then not great. It usually, sometimes it'll list um, beef or pork, but oftentimes not. Um, you most, know, most companies shy away from it because they'll lose their vegetarian. That's true. It's not customers. very common, except maybe in some organs and whatnot. Um, it is, I mean, I've never seen a gelatin capsule being listed as organic. Um, it's hard to say how much of the glyphosate and the antibiotics and all the other junk that they're feeding in cattle makes it down to that, but definitely some of it can, and it's not going to be from a healthy source originally. Um, HPMC is probably the best of the capsules out there, we would say. Um, it's a vegetable cellulose capsule. Um, it can be derived from a lot of different things, softwood, cotton, a um, bunch of different things, basically. It's a vegetarian alternative to gelatin. Um, it does have to be listed on the other ingredients. And like I said, as a general case, it is the better option. Um, most examples of the vegetable cellulose are GMO-free. Theoretically, they could be GMO, but I've never seen a GMO capsule yet. Um, another option is pulin, which is an extract of tapioca roots. Could be cornstarch, um, which can be GMO, and then it's fermented by a fungus. So again, for the people that have had 
fungal issues, candida issues, sensitivities, if they're taking in a capsule and it's made via fungal fermentation, that can reactivate different mental receptors and things like that and cause that type of reaction. And also as a fungal fermentation, it, it might be a histamine containing product. I mean, capsule. thankfully, at least for the pooling capsules, it's not made from a mold that's generally pathogenic in humans. So it's not an immediate no, but it's definitely not ideal in most cases. Um, I believe if you ever see an organic capsule on the market, it's made from pooling. That's the only organic that I know of. Um, the HPMC isn't, or I mean, most capsules don't list organic or whatnot, but the pooling, um, they will make, so at least you know it's not GMO, but it still is a fungal fermentation. Other things they can add, plasticizers, glycerin, sorbitols, all different teams like that, coloring agents, lubricants. I mean, you know, it's like every person nowadays wants their pill to look nice and pretty. I mean, it's really stupid. I mean, you know, let's say you have a kid that their fever's out of control and you have to give them something to bring it down. Go to the drugstore, every single, you know, acetaminophen for kids is gonna be filled with blue number whatever, six, yellow number this, titanium dioxide, sucralose or aspartame. And there's a company right now, Genexa, that actually makes healthy versions, you know, like they make an acetaminophen that doesn't have any fake um, sugars, it doesn't have any fake colorings, you know, it's at least as simple as you can get. So there is some awareness coming around nowadays, which is great, because those, I mean, you know, the acetaminophen can be a stress enough on the liver, and then add in all the other stuff in there, and it's just horrible. So at least there is a little bit of awareness coming around for some people. You know, I'm sure it's probably 0.0001% of the market share, but it's there. Um, herbs. I mean, like we talked about, you know, whole dried herbs, they retain um, nature's God-given ratios. Um, we think those are best by far. Whenever you try to, you know, disturb what God made, it goes a lot worse. Um, you could make Jurassic Park as a good example. Um, you could maybe make COVID, but I don't want to go into that. Um, you know, standardized herbs are going to be extracts. Um, when you make an extract, as a general rule, they're going to be using different chemicals, solvents, acetones, different things like that to isolate things. So it's going to increase one thing, but then lower another thing. So not only do you have the chemical residues, you're also changing that natural ratio. So in our opinion, it generally doesn't I mean, work. There are a few that will use just water, but again, it does upset the ratios. Yeah. Um, and, you know, also it's like, it's frustrating because, you know, everything in science nowadays needs to be isolated. So when I was in college, I did an internship at Yale Medical School. We were doing ovarian cancer research. And I had free time, and so I was taking this one herb, and I was, went to my um, PhD, I was working on it, and I'm like, hey, can we try this and see how it works on ovarian cancer cells? And, you know, I have the videos and everything. And, you know, it killed like 80% of the cells in like 72 hours or something like that. It was pretty cool. Then I went back to Arizona State University where I was in school and talked to this one lab about, hey, could we try to do this type of experiment? And they basically said, you know, nowadays you can't do experiments on whole herbs like that. No one wants that. You have to isolate the one component that might have done it and you have to throw away everything else and then just see how that does. But a lot of the time, that's not how things work. There's that synergy of how things work together. You can't take things out. And that's one issue that can happen with extracts. And we've been trained to think that way. You know, you think bananas, you think potassium. I mean, bananas are a thousand things. They're not potassium, you know. They're actually Orange pretty low. Vitamin C, you know. But, but, or when patients, you know, if, if we prescribe an herb, we were talking about this earlier, and they say, what's that for? I mean, basically, we want to say, it's for you. Because um, herbs you know, do like hundreds of different things in someone, and it's just the one that was appropriate for them. You know, we could say, oh, well, this one is for fungus, and this one's for this. But it, there's so much more than that, you know, as opposed to like just, say, taking the berberine out of um, golden seal or coptis and turning it into just a concentrated berberine substance, you know, it, or taking caprylic acid out of coconut to try to kill candida. It'll be very specific then, and it, it, you know, like we talked about the other day, it might be great for doing that, but all these other things will happen while a whole herb tends to be protective against many different things, so it stops things from, you know, from getting side effects from taking what you're taking. I mean, tinctures, 
you know, they definitely do change the ratios, like we said. Um, the one time I'm, we kind of like tinctures are for kids. I mean, sometimes you use them with adults. But for kids, they definitely can be beneficial. I mean, I've gotten my kids to take some disgusting stuff. Some of them are fails. And s I mean, once I took Scutellaria bicolentis, with, um, which Chris mentioned, one of my favorite herbs, and I tried to s literally I opened up the capsule, stuffed it in a raspberry, and they handed it to my son. <laughs> he would not touch raspberries for a month after that. And that was one of his favorite foods. <laughs> so you can ruin things pretty easily. And you know, so tinctures can come in handy for that besides, you know, oh, let's make a smoothie three times a day and make sure they drink the whole thing to get it in. I've done that. But tinctures definitely can be in handy for that. And one thing with tinctures is a lot of tinctures just say made with grain ethanol. That's generally going to be GMO corn ethanol, joy. Um, that's where you're putting in then. So, you know, unless it specifically says otherwise, just like if a supplement's a, um, if it's an um, organ-based supplement, if it doesn't say grass-fed or it doesn't say organic, you got to assume it's going to be grain-fed, pumped with antibiotics, pumped with all kinds of other stuff that's not going to be good. Um, you know, alcohol definitely can also be a liver stress, um, pro-inflammatory, depletes your zinc, things like that. So if we use tinctures, we generally like ones that they use organic, non-grain alcohol to do the extraction and then they actually replace it off. They boil it off and replace it with organic glycerin. So at least then it's the best case and kids think it tastes really good because glycerin tastes sweet. So we will use some tinctures along those lines if we do. Um, labels. Do you want to stand up and go over or do you want me to? Or? No, we're going to ask them. Okay, so this is a label of something we found online. Possibly the most popular multivitamin in the world. So one thing you would want to look at is the form of the nutrients. You know, so calcium carbonate, again, it's like taking a, a bite out of the sidewalk or, or taking a bite out of a seashell. Um, it's not absorbed really well. Um, it's cheap. So, you know, when uh, so many people, when they read a label, all they read is the percent of the RDA. So they might look and go, wow, this has a ton of calcium in it. But you know, again, it, it's not going to be absorbable. So you have to look at forms. You have to know forms. You know, potassium chloride is a really cheap form of um, potassium. And dicalcium phosphate is really cheap. Magnesium oxide is the least absorbable, cheapest form of magnesium. So you look at this, and you see these people just want the percentages to look good. They don't care about the quality at all. And then when you start reading the other things in there, which are a little bit hard to read from here, but they have cornstarch. Um, Yellow six, talcum, or talc, talcum powder, titanium dioxide. Polyvinyl alcohol. Polyethylene glycol. Uh, I mean, as a general rule, one thing, if you look at labels, and if it just says like magnesium, it doesn't actually say the form, automatically assume worst form possible. You just, unless they actually specifically state the form, assume it's the cheapest, worst form, and it's not going to be absorbed. I mean, I have patients that come in, and they're like, oh, yeah, my doctor told me to take 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. And I give them a less form, but they, told, they just told them to go to Costco, which I love Costco. They told them to go to Costco and get a calcium supplement. They're taking calcium carbonate. And I'm like, here's actually a form that your body can absorb. You don't need as much. It's going to work better. So that's you know, what we would consider the junk. Please throw this in the trash. Um, another one we'd consider junk, please throw this in the trash, um, calcium carbonate. Like my dad mentioned, you're basically, it's the calcium you're getting from a sidewalk. Um, you know, you general form, like citrate forms tend to be better, like a calcium citrate. Well, the positive thing about this one is it has magnesium stearate, so you won't absorb the calcium. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um... Yes. Um, you know, so again, you know, citrate can be a generally a better form. Or, well, actually, if I use calcium, we also oftentimes use MCHA, micro, microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, which is actually calcium derived from bones, because then you're actually getting the best form of calcium you can use because it's bone derived. Um, here's an example. I mean, someone asked um, Dr. Motley about what type of magnesium to take. I mean, I take, you know, Assuming it's a good brand, I mean, I have like seven different types of magnesium in my office. There's so many different types. You know, generally, magnesium citrate's better for constipation. Generally, magnesium citrate and malate's better for muscle tightness. But there's so much overlap. There's so many different types. 
Um, here's this one example. The magnesium aspartate, glycinate, gluconate, totally fine, fine forms. Um, nothing wrong with the form itself. But my dad can talk about, I mean, one, it has steric acid. Vegetable source could mean that it's cotton seed derived easily. And this has steric acid and magnesium stearate. But organic vegetable culture. So, I mean, I mean, organic vegetable culture isn't necessarily bad. It's, again, usually they take some of the magnesium and they feed it to either peas or buckwheat. And then they, they take the vegetable and they add it in. So in some um, people it's fine, but and generally it often is fungal derived. So that's just for the fungal sensitive people, it's not the best. Um, here is a high quote unquote vitamin C supplement. Yeah, this is promoted as a, a vitamin C supplement um, as a whole food one. So the dosage is low, you only have 12, 11 milligrams of vitamin C, but when you go down to the other ingredients, the second other ingredient is ascorbic acid. So basically, even though it's promoted as a whole food, the vitamin C is coming from the ascorbic acid. I mean, so, and you know, these other things in it, like carrot and sweet potato and some glandulars, I mean, you know, these pills are like this big. So, you know, if it has 20 ingredients, how much carrot are you getting in that pill? So, you know, you're basically just taking a small dose of chemical vitamins with a, a drop or two of some, you know, fruit, vegetable, animal product mix. Or it's amazing, like I had a patient come in on the supplement and they're like, yeah, my doctor took me off oats. They said I was really allergic to oats. And I'm like, did you read your supplement label? You're getting in oats. Or I've heard from supplement reps, oh, well, people don't react to the wheat in our supplements. It's not like normal wheat. It's wheat. I mean, maybe if you made a case it was organic wheat that was hand ground in Italy, but... Yeah, from yeah. a seed they found that was 5,000 years old. Um, you know, again, just looking at other ingredients, calcium, stearate, that's going to be a fat, it's going to decrease absorption, sucrose, form of sugar, modified cornstarch, may or may not be GMO depending on um, it, you know, looking at... Um, and it has white sugar. Yeah, and again, bovine. So bovines, cow, adrenal, kidney. If it's not specifically advertised, which I know this, is, this product specifically is not, as grass-fed or organic, it's going to be a grain-fed cow. Is it a feedlot versus a little bit of grass and then a lot of grain to fatten it up? Don't know, but it's definitely not an exclusively grass-fed or organic cow. So again, who wants liver or adrenal or kidney from an unhealthy animal? Sick, make, sick feeding sick doesn't really make sense. You have to be careful of alfalfa. Because al alfalfa in some people can promote autoimmune issues. You know, it's not really a food for humans, even though it's high in chlorophyll and has some other positive effects. Um, back with the Gerson therapy, which people would go down to Mexico and get treated for cancer, and they put them on 13 or 14 glasses of juice a day, including liver juice. Um, what would happen was they used to add alfalfa to the juice, and when they did, they found that they were getting a lot of, um, there were a lot of arthritis in the patients because of the promotion of autoimmune things from the alfalfa. When they took the alfalfa out, they didn't have that problem. Also, for a lot of people that are like gluten sensitive, we found they don't do well on wheat or barley grass. Even though wheat and barley grass are gluten free, it's like the body makes that connection. Like my dad was talking about yesterday with fish and mercury or ghee and dairy, the body will recognize, oh, I'm getting wheat in, and it creates that immune reaction, even though there's technically no gluten in wheat grass or barley grass. Um, you know, here's a supplement that we'll use on occasion in our office. I would consider a better one. Um, methylcobalamin, so again, one milligram out of about 1,500 milligrams. Um, microcrystalline cellulose um, and hypermellulose derived from cellulose capsule. And then again, though, you do have leucine. Leucine is going to be a majority, that and the microcrystalline cellulose of what's in there, silicon dioxide. Um, I definitely have seen people react to silicon, silicone. Um, that definitely can be an issue. Um, it might be one of your better alternatives if for some reason you wanted to take B12 and you didn't want to take it, like say you were a vegetarian, you didn't want to take a liver supplement or something like that. Yeah, but this, again, this is one of the better ones. Not perfect, but better. Um, here's another one. It's a magnesium citrate, another something that I use in the office. If you look at the other ingredients, almost as simple as you can get. Vegetarian capsule, cellulose and water, and ascorbyl palmitate. 
Um, you know, the nice thing magnesium is you're getting it 150 milligrams, so that is a majority of the capsule, but they're still adding ascorbopalmitate to help basically fatten up the runs and make them go faster and smoother. I mean, theoretically, we used to sometimes in the office carry something like this as a powder, but you find such little compliance, people don't want to take a powder. They just want to swallow pills. So, you know, it's hard to get those in the market. You can get a few powders on the market, but um, the quality's not that good. Um, here's just an example, excuse the blurriness of a tincture, no idea what brand it is, ethanol grain. Again, um, you, if it says ethanol at, or may or may not say grain, you have to assume it's gonna come from GMO corn. Could be a wheat-based also, so then just filled up with lots of glyphosate. You also have an eight to one extraction. Yes. A one to eight extraction. And who knows, yes. Um, here's an example of something, you know, as clean as you can get. An herb, a capsule, nice and simple. Again, if it's not a straight powder, that's as clean as you can get of those two ingredients. Um, here's another example of something I was having I was mixing this in my son's grape juice last night, and he actually did take it um, with some star anise. So again, grass-fed, I mean, could be New Zealand, USA, organ, gelatin capsule. Again, very simple, doesn't have all the added junk to it, and it is saying on the label it's grass-fed, so you know where it's coming from. Do we have the, the video? Oh, I forgot. I could pull it up. Can you? I don't know. <laughs> Can you try? Actually, no, I could pull it up. Um, and then here's a tincture, again, vegetable glycerin, water, organic cane alcohol. Um, here's what we're gonna do. We have about seven minutes left till the five minute bathroom break. My dad's gonna talk for two minutes while I'm gonna find a video and then we're gonna show that to finish. While he's doing that, are there any questions? Whoever Jory gives a microphone to. How many questions are you going to take? Till Noah's ready. Okay. Oh. Um, can you talk about whey protein supplements and sports supplements, like fillers, and is it the same amount of things? You know, a lot of those supplements come in big jars of powder, so they don't have to put that stuff in, but you're going to have to read the label because I've seen it go both ways. I mean, usually for protein supplements, I like very simple things, like just here's a, an organic grass-fed collagen powder, because once they start putting in, say, the branched chain amino acids and all the other things, you're gonna still end up with all the type of refining processes we're talking about. One more question. When it comes to taking supplements or actually like capsulating them, would it be better to maybe have more potent like vitamins and minerals and things like that and using vials and really small micro scoop, like scoopers and changing the way that people take supplements rather than trying to go with um, the flow? Yes and no. We're gonna round, when we do the conclusion, hopefully that'll answer, otherwise ask us again. All right, let's see if I did this correctly. I can narrate if we need to. It stops the active ingredient um, from sticking to the machinery. So you can encapsulate approximately 10 times faster than Talk if you don't have it. Acid. A couple of problems. One problem is it is a saturated fat that coats the active ingredient, makes it less absorbable. It's actually used to time release something, but it also, oh, again, you lose some of the absorbability of it. Um, another thing is some people claim it's an immune suppressant. So I want to show you the difference. It's not always listed on the label, but it's much preferred not to have it in your product. So this is ascorbic acid, straight ascorbic acid powder and a veggie cap. I dropped it in. You can see that there's some floating on the bottom. But over time, most or all of it will dissolve in the water. Okay, you know, we started with the whole cap. There's a little bit still in there. 
give it another minute or two, that last little bit will dissolve. This is the vitamin C stain ascorbic acid, but they added steric acid as a lubricant. So, first thing you see is nothing fell to the bottom. Reason being that steric acid, again, a saturated fat, is coating the top and not allowing the ascorbic acid to drop. And we'll, we'll just mix the straight ascorbic acid a little bit more. It's all dissolved. If you mix this, Basically, nothing happens. It's still all floating on the top. If you look closely, you can kind of see a layer of what I would call scum floating on the top of the water that's going to be there forever. And if you look at the side of the glass now, you see how it coats the glass compared to the one that doesn't have it in it. So again, steric acid is a cheap thing that supplement companies do, but it's to the detriment of the patient. So even if it has the same amount of ascorbic acid in it, you're not going to absorb this compared to this. Because the thing that's most important is your, your stomach produces hydrofluoric acid, and hydrofluoric acid is for protein digestion. But what if the nutrient you're taking needs to be mixed with the hydrofluoric acid to, to help break down? Now, hydrofluoric acid doesn't break through fat. So if you have steric acid coating the supplement, the hydrofluoric acid does not break through it. And that won't start getting digested till further on in the small intestine where your body produces lipase. So you, you, they use steric acid to time release things because they know it stops, um, it, it basically stops absorption of it. So if it has that in it, again, it's, it's just a, it's a red flag that the supplement's not going to get absorbed as well and the company is just shortcutting things or they're just working without a knowledge base on supplementation. Steric acid or magnesium sterate or calcium sterate, anything with that steric sterate in there, which is a lot of stuff. They're, companies are getting a little bit better. There are more companies now that aren't putting it in, but I'd still say that 80, 85% put it in, at least. Um, do we have time for another question or no? We're going to save it for the, the okay. end. So hopefully Carrie... Oh, wait, wait, don't we have a couple about more happiness wait, don't and we, not glue? You didn't have another slide or two? Oh, no. We had another slide or two. Oh, sorry. We had, we had conclusions. I forgot about that. But basically, the conclusions are, you know, try to get your nutrients through whole food. You know, you're gonna need less nutrients if you don't have any hidden infections, because the hidden infections are gonna use up a lot of nutrients. If you're not around toxic chemicals, if your stress levels are reasonable, if your stress levels are high, you're gonna use up your tyrosine, your B6, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing would, so, you know, use nutrient-dense foods, you know, assuming you're not vegetarian, things like liver, you know, wild fruits, nutrient-dense, vegetables, seaweeds, etc. And when you look at vitamins and minerals in the form that you would buy them in a bottle, you know, and they're, they're not like a whole food, like a ground up organ or something, treat them as pharmaceuticals. Short period of time to do something that's specifically needed. Occasionally people will need it longer because of some genetic defect, but for the most part, they're a refined product that doesn't exist in nature. So again, treat them kind of with the same caution that you treat medications. And kind of like Chris was talking about earlier and we were talking about with different infections. If you have infections, you can have intestinal permeability, you're not gonna be absorbing your food properly and you're not gonna be getting all your nutrients from your food. So if you can work on your gut, if you can get rid of the bad pathogens of the gut, get rid of that intestinal permeability, then you're gonna absorb your food much better and get a higher percent of your nutrients from your diet, which is very important. Um, and then we just had some different links where we got a lot of the info from today, but all of it's pretty easily accessible online if you actually start digging into it and searching. Thank, Thank you. Thank you guys, and we'll be back up in an hour.